Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, April 10th, 2019. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week we're going to be talking about, guess what? The black hole picture it's taken big. by the it's Event black. Horizon Telescope. Joining me this week, we've got... Uh, oh, right. We will also be talking... There's a couple of other, other stories. Other science happened, yeah, other too. Other science <laughs> might have happened. So we will be I talking about... Um, revisiting Mars's methane, uh, an artificial aurora, uh, volcanoes on metal asteroids are so metal, uh, as well as curiosity, seeing two solar eclipses on Mars, and then to give you keep you updated on some exciting things that are now going to happen tomorrow. Joining me this week on my screen, I've got Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Kimberly. Hey, Fraser. Happy Black Hole Day. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Black, Black Hole Day. Day. You know, hilariously, I accidentally stole your happy podcast day for my question show and awesome. i was like i didn't even know and i was like where i was watching at the no. end of the Coming a phenomenon of the episode i'm like oh no i said you know happy question Other show day are stealing it you right. so am i stealing it or have you infected my brain i'm not sure Eww, six of one half <laughs> dozen of the other it is it is wonderful to uh to hear that every week uh we've also got morgan renberg dr morgan renberg Hey, Fraser. Happy podcast day. <laughs> See? Now it's just going on out of your mouth. Uh, Paul is still uh, doing whatever, something black hole related, something dance related. He's a busy boy. I think we're going to get him for three episodes between now and the end of the season uh, from what his busy schedule <laughs> permits. So we brought in another ringer, this time another astrophysicist. Uh, let's see. Who is it? Dr. Ian O'Neill. Hello, Fraser. How's it going? It's been so long since we I know, since we hung I know. up. We had you uh, I know, on the show, you. on my show last week. So, welcome back. Well, I haven't been on the sh any of your shows for years, so I'm just trying to catch up. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, and and you've been very busy, but today you're now free. Yeah, I mean, it was a busy week going into Wednesday. Of course, there was a lot of excitement. Um, I wrote a couple of things for uh, University of Waterloo. That was kind of fun. Uh, nice to work with those guys. In fact, um, it was um, Avery Broderick who was on the NSF um, feed today that I interviewed. So uh, really top guy. So I wrote a couple of articles for that. And then, of course, all the news releases today. So yeah, it's been a lot of typing. All right, so we're going to get into the news. Before we do, one last reminder to everybody that they should absolutely join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is, of course, the wonderful community of uh, fans slash executive producers. And uh, you should go to wshcrew.space. They will hook you up. They'll set you up with their internal community, access to their discussion forums. You can chat during the live show right here, and uh, and you'll find out when all the new things are coming out. So wshcrew.space. All right, Ian, you had a hand in helping actually get the news out there, so I give you the honor of telling us the interesting thing that happened this week. Well, it's been a long time coming. Um, I think I was going through my old archives of articles I was writing. I think it was like 10 years ago I first wrote about the uh, Event Horizon Telescope. And, of course, the Event Horizon Telescope is – a worldwide network of radio telescopes that have all been, um, they're all working together. And it's this, I think it was like 20 years in the making, if not longer, that uh, the concept for imaging a supermassive black hole was conceived. And it's taken them that long to um, develop the systems, the methods, and the technologies to actually um, make this happen. Because of course, we're looking at two black holes. One is our supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. And the other one is a, another supermassive black hole, in fact, it's an uber massive black hole, as I like to call it, um, in the center of uh, the galaxy M87. And um, they're both very interesting objects, but it just so happens today we got to see the furthest away one. So we got to see the M87's um, supermassive black hole, which weighs in at a whopping 6.5 billion solar masses. And all these facts and figures have been burnt into my brain, and I don't know how I'm getting rid of them. Um, but it's about 50 million light years away, which is a hell of a lot further away than our supermassive black hole. Um, but because of um, reasons, uh, the uh, Event Horizon Telescope um, 
uh, team decided to go after the M87 black hole first. Um, I actually dug into it. I, I, I went to you to, to start with to All find right. out like why <laughs> fact checked <laughs> to fact check yeah exactly because i mean this was the thing we had been telling everybody to expect the first picture of the supermassive black hole at the heart of the milky way yeah. and so we i was so ready we looked at it and nope um it was it was m87 and literally you sound so disappointed at what super, we got <laughs> i was definitely a little disappointed and so um i wanted oh, to see that i wanted to you know, my reputation was on the line. I had been promising people this was going to happen. So I reached out to Ian and I said, uh, Ian, because uh, I because Ian had had, I mean, Ian is a science journalist, but he is he actually, as, you, as Ian said, he's been interviewing people. Uh, he worked on some of the press releases for the University of Waterloo. He had the inside scoop. And it turns out Ian had actually asked someone this exact same question. And Ian, what was the answer that they what was the gist that they gave you? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of complicated because when I was chatting to um, Avery, um, I said, you know, look, I don't mean to be funny, but I'm kind of disappointed that we're not going to see our black hole. And I think his response was, who cares? It's a black hole. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I, I, I understand that, but I want to see ours because that's ours. Um, but no, he said, actually, the explanation, the reason, well, it was actually on the live feed today. One of the reasons were that um, our supermassive black hole is quite dynamic. So it's um, changing quite quickly compared to the dynamics surrounding the supermassive black hole in M87. So that's just on like an exposure level, I suppose. I mean, because uh, if you imagine it, the Event Horizon Telescope is a big camera and you know, it has to have an exposure time where it looks at the, the photons that are coming, traveling all that distance from the supermassive black hole. It takes time to build the image. So I suppose if we were looking at a more dynamic black hole, like our supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, it'll be more blurry because there's more stuff going on. So there was that explanation that was mentioned today, but Avery mentioned to me that one of the biggest problems we've got by looking at our supermassive black hole in our galaxy is that we're actually inside the our galaxy. So we're looking through a lot of dusty interstellar space. And so the signal from the supermassive black hole by the time it reaches the Event Horizon Telescope is scattered quite a lot. And so it takes, it takes longer to get a better image. And then if you look at the supermassive black hole in M87, it's actually a, a ton of um, empty intergalactic space. And apparently the Event Horizon Telescope is very sensitive to scattering in the midway point between the target and us. So if you imagine the midway point between us and M87, there's nothing there. So that makes it a clearer image. Whereas yeah, I had I had heard, um, so, you know, that from you, I got that. And then I did yeah. some digging as well, and, and someone reached out to me. And they said that potentially the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way is going to be brightening and dimming on the order of 20 to 30 minutes. Right, yeah. So it is a completely different sort of dynamic image, a totally different job. And so because the 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 one at m87 is whatever six billion times the mass of the sun and rotates you know close to the speed of light but it still takes so long that it, that it that it won't change as much as the one that's at the at the heart of the milky way so so it All sounds right, like though, it's... I, as somebody who's not a galactic astronomer i was totally blown away that we're seeing variations at all i guess i assumed that day-to-day -day variations much less minute-to-minute -minute ones would not rise to the level of, of being ob observing or like observable is that was that a surprising thing well and well, it might the... even be that we'll get animations right right that just seems crazy yeah. to me i, I know the accretion disk would be static on the order of you know centuries or something yeah, millions of years yeah no, that was that was a huge surprise to me because um, my relationship with um, University of Waterloo started last year. And if you remember, there was that uh, news release about um, observing a flare near the near our supermassive black hole, and um, they did a lot of theoretical work like ten years ago on these flares that are happening in the accretion disk in Sagittarius, Sagittarius A star. And apparently, these flares happen daily, and they 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 create a hot spot in the in the accretion disk of the super of the supermassive black hole and it kind of degrades over time but it kind of appears and then a few hours later it's gone so these flares and also they're kind of supercharged because of course the gravitational lensing near the supermassive black holes basically amplifies the effect of these flares and they happen quite frequently so i suppose i mean as you're saying fraser that yeah it, 
there's other factors that create this, this brightening effect, including flares. So yeah, just really dynamic objects, which was a huge surprise. You just think they're just static, as you were saying. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Uh, so, so, and so what else did they say today? What else did you learn? Whew, uh, I mean, yeah, Einstein we got a picture. was right. Einstein was right, everybody. So can I'm you specifically sorry. explain I'm... how how Einstein was right? What was he? What 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 features was he expecting to see, or oh. that had he predicted that astronomers had confirmed? Well, I'm not going to bag on Einstein, but but he wasn't necessarily right. It's all the physicists that came after him that used his mathematical framework of the universe to explain what singularities are and then black holes. Because when um, shortly after Einstein published his work back in what uh, to, uh, 1915, remember back then, Fraser? Or yeah, for sure. Vivid, vivid. Um, uh, he, when he first published it, of course, all these scientists came on board and started using using it to develop their own theories of, of the universe and they were using it as their framework. And um, it was Schwarzschild, yeah, Carl Schwarzschild. I forget, I don't know how you pronounce Schwarz his last name. Schwarzschild. Schwarzschild. Yeah. Schwarzschild, Schwarz isn't it? Yeah. Um, he came up with the idea of a natural singularity in space. And he used Einstein's theories to explain it. And Einstein didn't like it. He actually wrote a, a paper saying that those kind of singularities cannot exist in nature. And of course, he was kind of proven wrong. Um, so By he being proven right. the idea of singularities. So, he, and actually, um, it was 12 years after his death that black holes actually got their name. So he didn't really have much of an influence, well, yeah, obviously an influence, but he didn't actually like the theory of what would become black holes. So I would say that, yes, I wouldn't say it's Einstein was right. I would say general relativity was right. Yeah. Because that was used as the framework to explain black holes. Right. He uh, was wrong because he was right yeah yeah he does that a lot the cosmological <laughs> constant i mean he just he just stress tests his own theory i think that's kind of a cool way of doing it i mean yeah. that's a kind of a bit of a boring uh thing to do and but, can you talk uh, a bit yeah. about just like what went into taking this picture what oh, sorry I missed what, the what went into taking this picture what 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 happened because it's like we've been waiting two years how did it all come together yeah, so basically we've got, um, as I mentioned, I mean, these supermassive black holes, they, they're too small, even though they're massive, they're very, very far away, so they're very small in the sky. It's like trying to um, image a golf ball or an orange on the, surface, on the surface of the moon from Earth. So you'd have to have a very big telescope that's probably the size of the Earth, and we can't build one the size of the Earth. So what uh, astronomers did, they networked. Um, I think it was eight or nine radio telescopes together, all the way from the um, Atacama Desert all the way to the South Pole, met with them all together, and they collaborated to take simultaneous observations of these two targets. And then they brought all the data back, huge amounts of data. I forget what the um, how much it was, but it was something like all five, the selfies in the world five, ever. It, five petabytes, I think. Yeah. The, I, the, uh, the I thing think that I loved... That is was that it was a half a ton of hard drives that's insane right that is just insane yeah and yeah and i heard that they had they had, so they had real hard problems couriering these hard drives like from the south pole because of course half the year is inaccessible so this is kind of astronomy is the most extreme not only have you got these really extreme observatories that are doing their thing you also got to transport them the the data in hard drives i mean they can't transmit this stuff over the internet it would just take millennia to do that so it's just a huge chunk of data and they brought it back to this as it was in mit or harvard i forget where the um... well so they from from what i understand they, they actually broke it up into four teams and they they, yeah. they did their initial processing in four, as four separate groups to independently confirm what they got and then they met shared their images Ag agreed and then the f and then yeah. all of the final data was taken back to harvard and they they did the final simulation yeah so so it's a little wonder that it's taken this long to develop i mean because for the last probably five years we've been hearing like rumors oh it's going to be next year they're going to see the first image of the black hole and i think the last estimate i heard it was going to be the start of last year and then of course that kind of rolled by and i was asking questions trying to write articles about it, trying to find out when we're going to see this image. And they basically said they're in no massive rush. They want to basically get it right. And they basically want to get all the data together and also 
process it correctly. Um, but this whole method of bringing um, data from all these uh, separated um, radio telescopes is known as very long baseline interferometry. And it's a well-known uh, method to create a larger virtual telescope from lots of smaller telescopes. And we just got to look at the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, ALMA, in uh, Chile. They have, what, 60-odd smaller telescopes all working in concert on this plateau. And they're able to create this virtual telescope. So that's basically what the, um, the Event Horizon Telescope is doing. It's creating a virtual telescope, which is as wide as our planet. And so, of course, now you've got all these small telescopes. Of course, there's a, there's a ton of technical issues they had to get through to actually make sure all the data matched up. But basically, they just observed these, um, these <clears throat> two targets uh, for long enough, got the data, brought it all together, compiled it. There was a ton of um, of uh, algorithm work that had to go into actually interpreting the data because I think that probably took longer than actually collecting the data in the first place. Yeah, well, everybody had to, um, they had to all have an atomic clock that were yeah. all started at the same time that was measuring their observations and there were 1.3 millimeter wavelength observations and then they had to run this time code along with the observations that they were making so that they could take all of these ob observations and match them up to the specific wave yeah. right yeah. <laughs> of the 1.3 millimeter wave every single one of them all that data over the course of seven days for all the observations that they made is the earth was turning around and around and every time the, the the telescope would come into view they would have to you know gather all their data and line it back up again and 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 make this perfect observation uh yeah. it's just a it's a it's a stunning a feat of coordination because then and you can only do this with with sub millimeter like you can only do this with with wavelengths this big yeah you can't do yeah, it with you actually have telescope. to cut through all the material that's around in the black hole yeah. anyway and you actually see the emissions that are coming from directly outside the event horizon and probably the most exciting thing for me um following all the theories that went into this i mean all the models and all the simulations running up to this grand event were all based on general relativity and there were some like variations as to what theorists thought they might see so you had like either a perfect um perfect silhouette of the event horizon um, with surrounded by some brightness um or a slightly oblate um or it was slightly squished depending on how fast it was spinning so they had a few different options as to what general relativity what to expect from general relativity but as it turned out it's actually a perfect circle surrounded by this bright spot which is almost picture perfect to some of the models that were done yeah. and that they, they, they were considered like the most mundane models like the most what you would expect to see models and so i think it's like they within a precision of like 10 percent, which it seems which is very small they're going to actually narrow that down with further observations but it's very very close to exactly what general relativity would predict which kind of makes things really interesting now because it's like where does general relativity break? I mean, if it doesn't break near a, an event horizon of a black hole, where does it break? Does it break at all? What does that mean for gravity? What does that mean for us? It's, it's like there's so many existential questions now hanging over physics. I love it. Um, so, have, I mean, have you got the image? In, can you pick out any specific details in the image that maybe to help people understand kind of what they're looking at while I put it up on the screen? Sure. Yeah, can do. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just here. I'll just share my screen so you can even see it as well. Yeah, I mean, so straight away, you've got the central blob. That was the, that's the black hole. That is the event horizon right there, right in the middle. It's like plain as day. I was kind of expecting to see like a crescent or like kind of fluffy image, and you'd have to squint a bit and do some processing to actually see it. But that's basically the, uh, the event horizon. At the moment, it's kind of blurry, apparently, uh, with, with uh, observations in the future and if they add more uh, radio telescopes to the event horizon telescope they're going to make that sharper so we're going to see more features because if you remember back to the some of the um, simulations that were produced you got some kind of wisps of like hot gas that kind of trails in front of the, the black hole and this is kind of the debate as well i mean are, i think a few people are calling it a silhouette or a shadow people are calling it a shadow I, I don't really see it as a shadow i see it more of a silhouette because a lot of this the bright emissions are getting bent around space time from behind the black hole and that it's kind of 
um, being redirected in our direction. And that's why we can actually see the circle of the event horizon. Um, and yeah, and these, these bright emissions are coming from immediately surrounding um, the black hole. Um, is spinning and I think there was some speculation and some um, ideas as to what I did where, where it's spinning I think it's kind of semi facing us and if it's got jets the jets are kind of coming towards us but are, not I, quite. I mean I, these I, kind of look jet like here but but yeah. I had heard like I think uh, Avi Loeb had say it had said that you know you're going to see the brightening on the edge that's turning towards us yeah. And then the dimmer part is the edge that's turning away from us because this thing is spinning at, at essentially the speed of light. Just, you know, right. whatever is the limitations predicted by by Einstein again. Exactly. And, and of course, these emissions are coming from the hot gases. And because these hot gases are getting dragged around and are orbiting the black hole, so they're getting basically shredded by this extreme friction near the uh, near the event horizon. And that's what's producing these incredibly hot emissions. And I was scanning through one of the papers that went live today um and they were they estimated that the plasma immediately surrounding the event horizon um is being heated to like six billion degrees kelvin <laughs> million degrees i mean it's these just the numbers of associated with black holes are just mind-boggling yeah but can we go back to talking about the picture we didn't get to see and compare that to this picture you know the black hole in our galaxy is obviously much 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 closer to to us it's a, it's a smaller object but it's yeah. vastly closer so are we expecting to see more resolution across the disk in the other image than we get here imagining we don't have this disruption from from the dust and all that i don't know to be honest. i mean i've been looking at the um the models and they look kind of similar and i think that is one of the that is going to be one of the big findings um how do black holes scale and we know that smaller black holes, well, certainly ours, a supermassive black hole is more dynamic than this massive one. But do the laws that govern the event horizon of a ultra massive black hole like the one in M87, um, are they the same, uh, same laws that govern the smaller black hole in our galaxy? Um, and to be honest, I don't know if they're going to look an awful awfully different i don't think um you would think because uh the uh, m87 is so much further away that it's going to be a little bit more blurry uh, but then again we also have to contend with um you know interstellar scattering in in our galaxy so i think it may well just balance out um because i was looking at some of the models and to be honest there's not an awful lot in it yeah uh, so we've got a whole bunch of questions that i want to sort of uh, send them your way, Ian. Uh, rapid no. fire here. Um, uh, Nancy's asking, how serendipitous is it that M87 is oriented so that the accretion disk is as shown? Would it being rotated 90 degrees have had a significant impact on the view the Event Horizon Telescope would have had on it? So does the orientation, did we get a good orientation or is it? would it look kind of the same no matter how we were looking at it? Um, yeah, if, if we were, I would say the most unlucky orientation is if we were looking directly down its um, axis of rotation, because you wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't get this nice crescent. You wouldn't get like these gases that are kind of speeding towards us, making one side brighter than the other. And I think even though it is, you know, there is a inclination there, I think this is, uh, I think everybody's quite happy. I mean, when I spoke with, with, um, with Avery about this, he was saying that basically it was a dream come true to see this. It, he was actually, his mind was blown as to how precise this observation was compared to his models. And he actually assumed that it was a test. He assumed that they'd injected this image into the system to test uh. the, uh, the, 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 um, the analysis guys who were looking at these images just to make sure that they were doing the correct analysis. Um, and I believe that was also suspected with the gravitational wave discovery. They, they thought that, you know, the first de definitive image they thought was an injection of a model into their system to test them to see if they can actually recognize it as, a, as gravitational waves. So I think as far as the uh, view that we've got and the inclination that we've got, I think um, we were very lucky as far as I can tell. Um, I, I think we'd have to be very unlucky to get decent inclination so i think it's you'd have to be dead on 
looking down its um, axis of rotation to really not get an awful lot of benefit. Um, but yeah, it's I, I'm yeah. just still I'm just my mind's still blown. Away. <laughs> so it's, um, it's hard to to say. <laughs> um, Arjun is asking, um, was M87 just the biggest black hole in the direction as the biggest black hole in the same direction as Sagittarius A star? Were there other candidates? Um, yeah, I also asked that because I was like, why are we just looking at two? And it just so happens they are the biggest black hole candidates in the sky. And it doesn't mean they're the closest. It just means that M M87 that just happens to be 2,000 times bigger, even though it's 2,000 times further away than our black hole. So actually, their apparent magnitude in the sky is approximately the same, give or take a few percent. So we're actually really lucky. So our black hole is a lot smaller. It's 2,000 times smaller than the M87, um, but it's also 2,000 times closer. So we can actually see them as approximately the same size in the sky. So we are very lucky. And also, you, if you want, if, of all the um, black hole candidates you'd want to observe, apparently these two would be very high on the list because you've got this extremely big, massive black hole that's sitting inside this giant elliptical galaxy. And you've got a, a comparatively small supermassive black hole in our galaxy. Um, so ours is like considered the every man of black holes. So it's like an average, right. average supermassive black hole. Yeah, it's hilariously only got 4.1 yeah. million times the mass it, of the, of the that's sun. That's tiny compared to M87. Yeah. <laughs> so M87 is like one of the biggest black holes known. So we are extremely lucky to have these two candidates. So, yeah, I mean, it's just serendipitous that we've got these two wonderful candidates. It just so happens that one of them just is just so big <laughs> uh av scott and flower asks what would be the next target for optical or or for interferometry any idea so i had heard that based on how happy they were with this that all kinds of other targets all kinds of other black holes are are on the table now yeah i i, I believe so i mean and uh if you add more i mean you can't really make the event horizon telescope bigger than our planet, unless you went into space or whatever and did something fancy in like 50 years time or 100 years time. Um, but it, as you add more observatories to the network on our planet, you're gonna get better resolution. And so that could put even further, or black holes that are further away in, in the contention to actually see them. Um, I don't know if they've actually announced any, but uh, it would be really cool if they can image some more. Um... And then the other question that I saw here was, uh, right, Arjun asks, if a star was passing close enough to Sagittarius A star to be torn apart, could the EHT observe that? I believe so. It would come up as a as a brightening. It yeah. would be a flaring event. And that was, um, and in fact, not just the EHT, I mean, the um, gravity instrument with the very large telescope, which is like infrared um, optical wavelengths in, in the Chilean desert, um, they they actually tracked this um, this this flare, which was basically a blob of gas that got consumed by our our supermassive black hole. So if a star strayed too close and got swallowed up, hell yeah, that would be quite a big <laughs> firework that we'd be able to observe. I mean, we we see that as an emission in gamma rays already when something gets gobbled up by the by the the black hole at right. the center of the of the Milky Way. It's just that we don't see it actually happening. We just hear it scream. We don't see it die. And yeah. so if – but you can imagine, right, some future where they're constantly observing one of these black the, – you know, they've got a more permanent event horizon telescope that is constantly observing some of these black holes and would see one of these events happen. That would be a enormous boon for, for science. Yeah, exactly. And, and this would be one way to um, probe the very limits of the event horizon. So this is one thing that I had the, the fortune of uh, visiting um, ALMA and the Very Large Telescope in Chile uh, back in 2016. And I was interviewing a few of the, uh, the, the astronomers there. And they were really excited about this new age of the Event Horizon Telescope, because, of course, ALMA is part of the, that, that network, but also the VLT's gravity instrument. And they're kind of not competing with each other. Well, probably competing with each other, but um, they're, they're going to have um, um, observations in different wavelengths 
that will um, hopefully complement each other. And they operate over different time scales. They operate over, operate over different spatial scales as well. So you can get a better overall picture about the dynamics near a supermassive black hole. And you can imagine just watching one of these flares go off. If you could actually watch um, the, um, the, the, the accretion disk rotating around the supermassive black hole, and if you see one of these bright, uh, like flaring events, one of these hotspots orbiting with the supermassive black hole as it gets closer and closer to the event horizon, you actually have a probe then. You've actually got this little bright spot that you can actually track going around the around this, you know, extremely stressed space-time. And so this then acts as a probe where you can actually test um, general relativity at its most extreme, right at the very edge of an event horizon. So yeah, we're, we're only just beginning. Yeah. I mean, this is the cool thing. This isn't the end. I mean, yeah. admittedly, I've um, already sent off to get this this image printed and go on my wall. <laughs> so I think the next one that's going to come out tomorrow will be beautifully crisp and sharp, which will be a pain. But no, it's the, it's the first image, um, and it can only get better from here on yeah. in. And, you know, the ingenuity of these, of these scientists is just insane. So I, I, I don't know where we're going to be in 10 years' time. I mean, 10 years ago, I, I, I thought this was just a... A flight, of, you know, a flight of fancy. But this, but now, you know, we're actually seeing the event horizon of the black hole for the first time. I don't know where we're going to be in ten years. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be crazy. Well, Ian, uh, thank you so much for uh, both working on the story and and bringing your knowledge this week. Uh, what a, I mean, it's just it's so exciting. It it is the big so far. It's the big event of the year, I would say, yeah. and uh, it'll definitely go on our top ten list for the year. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Kimberly, yeah. what have you got that isn't about black holes? Oh, I have one thing about black holes I need to say first before it's not about black holes. And that is a congratulations to the MIT grad student who put together the final image that we've been showing all day, Katie Bowman, who's yes. an MIT grad student. Uh, kudos. Excellent image. Got to give a shout out for that. I mentioned first. on Twitter, and I will, I'll post a link into the somewhere, um, that she did a video three, 2006, so three years ago. It's like three years ago. Yeah, yeah. Talk, it was a TED Talk talking about like what, how it's going to work and how she's going to make the simulation and what they're expecting to see and what kinds of things you're going to be able to rule out. And, and it is, if you watch that, you will have so much context for looking at this photograph. So I highly recommend everybody, maybe someone can- I'll, Go I'll... check out her work. It's awesome. We've been yeah. sharing her work all day. We've been talking about it for the past 40 minutes. Yep. So yeah. Good. Yeah. So this I needed, her... needed to mention that before I move yeah. on. I mean, everybody, I mean, 200 astronomers, eight telescopes, uh, thousands of people involved in the project, but uh, the actual picture uh, is, yep. is all Katie. Go grad students. Uh, all right. So aside from black holes, other science happened apparently in this past week. I've forgotten most of it because this sort of like washed out all of the, the science that I remembered. But there was a really cool study that came out last week about the potential for volcanism. Uh, we're calling it volcanism on metal asteroids. So, I mean, we have volcanism on Earth. It's like silica rock. We have cryovolcanism on all sorts of icy places in the solar system and now we're talking about volcanism molten metal coming up welling up from underneath the surfaces of these metal asteroids and flowing across the surface uh and so this is a thing that was proposed mainly for uh something for nasa's psyche mission to look at when it goes to visit one of these metal asteroids uh launching in 2022 uh and it's sort of a, it's a new take on a very familiar concept of the, an asteroid was very hot or molten right after it formed, perhaps through a collision that stripped the metal asteroid out of a planetary core or something like that. It's all molten. It slowly solidifies on the surface, but underneath it's still molten metal and somehow through instabilities or a crack in the surface or something like that, that molten material wells up and spews across the surface. And it could leave signals that Psyche might look for. Uh, and it would just sort of be, it, it's a new type of planetary science that we haven't ever studied up close before. I mean, we've, we've looked at rocky planets, we've looked at icy things, we've looked at, you know, regular asteroids, which also do weird stuff. 
And this is a new kind of weird asteroid that could be doing new weird things. I have heard, I can't, I'm not if I can confirm it, but uh, Psyche is the most massive asteroid. I don't know if that statistic massive is true. Massive in what sense? Ceres is vast, has vastly more mass. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Could Psyche is so much I denser, but I'm not sure Vesta? How, yeah, I, what the total I, mass is. Ceres and Vesta are by far the yeah. two most yeah. massive. But it right. could be the densest. That yeah, I would It could be the densest. It's probably the largest it is uh, so metal. Like metal, metal, metal asteroid, I would guess. Um, but I mean, uh, one of the one of the other benefits of like if molten metal volcanism or ferrovolcanism, as they're calling it, is true, it would give us a look at what's inside Psyche, uh, which is something that the mission is not equipped to do. I mean, it's set up to do all sorts of high energy and magnetic experiments when it visits this metal hunk of metal in the middle of space but it's not going to like drill to the interior wait so it, it, is the claim that these metal volcanoes are happening today or that they happened way back when during back formation in the, now back that stuff in the is, past now that there, stuff is solidified on the surface yeah so they're saying this is something that probably happened just after uh, if it happened it's something that probably happened just after the asteroid formed back when everything was still really hot and, and moving around. And uh, sort of the, the timing of it, sorry, there's a creature. Uh, the timing of it, <laughs> apologies. Oh, it's a cute creature there. It's a cute creature. Uh, the timing of it uh, is still up for debate. It depends on what the interior composition of Psyche is, uh, essentially how pure the metal is and what other materials might be mixed into it. Uh, affects how it cools, whether it formed a solid shell with a molten interior or if it solidified from the inside out. Uh, and it would also affect how any interior molten material made its way to the surface, what, what the volcanoes looked like. Uh, and that will affect what sort of signatures it may leave on the surface. So all of this is still a, it may happen. It, it may have, sorry, it may have happened. Uh, we don't know. We don't know what it would look like. Here's what it may look like if indeed it did happen. Let's go look. Yeah. So you would just see like volcan volcanic lava flows of gold. Yeah, of, yeah, of gold, of metal. <laughs> of iron and nickel. That would be so oh, weird. So valuable. Be... You'd see you'd see weird discolorations on the surface, or you'd see pock marks from where multi material landed back on the surface, uh, you probably wouldn't see like a volcano cone or <clears throat> like pillows of lava like we think of, like uh, from volcanoes here on Earth. That's just sort of yeah subtle things to look for. I mean, think about the the lower gravity, but yeah. also the the more density, the temperatures that would be involved. Yeah, but and the vastly different materials you're working with too, because at the end of the day, it's still mostly metal. There might be a little bit of other stuff mixed in there, some carbon, some silicon, some gases. There you go. So David, it's still mostly the, metal. <laughs> David in the chat is saying Psyche's density is 6.98 grams per cubic centimeter. Excellent. That's, a, that's really That's a lot. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, new type of volcanism to look out for. That's awesome. Yeah. Because I, I remember when um, the Dawn mission went to um, Sirius and there was all this talk about seeing, you know, cryovolcanoes and you know, will, will we see them? And we just had no idea. And then, of course, we had, we found some candidates and there was evidence of water there. And, of course, when New Horizons went to, went to Pluto and saw this crazy uh, dynamics going on on the surface, um, I, I've stopped discounting weird stuff in the solar <laughs> system there. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna see we're gonna see metal volcanoes. <laughs> and there's so gonna metal. be surprises on that thing. I'm telling. There's you. gonna be so many ways that yeah. this that this asteroid is weird. Yeah. I mean, we were we we talk so much about how every asteroid we visit is weird in some way. This is gonna be like even more weird. It's gonna be bonkers. <laughs> yes, that's Morgan. the word for it. Yeah, speaking of weird in, in the solar system, if you were watching five years ago, we were chatting about this really cool discovery that Curiosity made of this one-time observation of methane on the Martian surface. And it was years and years of no methane, and then suddenly one day this big pulse of methane, and then years and years of, of no methane. And it was weird because it was just once, but it was also weird because a bunch of other telescopes 
on Earth and even at Mars looked for this methane and they couldn't find it. Uh, and so I think nobody like, doubted what Curiosity was seeing, but the thought was, well, maybe this little bit of methane just kind of popped up right under the rover and it saw it and then it went away and nobody else noticed. But here we are five years later and some researchers are going back through some data on uh, the European Mars Express orbiter. And lo and behold, they've found this exact bump. They had observations covering the area that Curiosity was on exactly one day later. And what they saw was nothing, 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 a big bump of methane, and then back to nothing, nothing, nothing. And in fact, they observed even more methane than Curiosity did. Curiosity saw something like five parts per billion, and Mars Express saw something like 15 parts per billion. Uh, so a lot more. And across the whole region that they were looking at, which is like hundreds of thousands of square kilometers, it would be the equivalent of like 49 tons of, of methane. So, so not a trivial amount. Uh, and what's neat is, is that because Mars Express has a much larger field of view than Curiosity does looking you know, right in its vicinity on the surface, they were able to better understand where this methane might have come from, which has long been the puzzle for, for Curiosity. And they think it actually didn't come from Gale Crater, where Curiosity saw it, but came from the surrounding area and then kind of drifted into Gale Crater. And in that surrounding area, we have a number of places where there are these crevices that kind of go down into the ground. And there's evidence that there could be ice underneath those, those crevices. And that's important because here on Earth, most of our method underground is, is trapped in ice, what we call clathrates. And so we have now sort of a picture where the same physics that traps methane here on Earth could be trapping methane on Mars, releasing it in a blast event, uh, which is very common here on Earth, observed by two totally different spacecraft with two totally different methods, and then, and then not again. So this answers pretty much all of our questions, except for the big one, which is where did this methane come from? Was it life or was this an abiotic process like serpentinization? Aliens. Sorry. Aliens. I was getting there quickly. Yeah. It definitely aliens. Bacteria. But, but I mean, wasn't <clears throat> one of the goals of the ExoMars mission to send a, a spacecraft that could try to get deeper into this question, Morgan? Yeah. So the Trace Gas Orbiter, which is part of ExoMars, is currently orbiting Mars and has instruments that should be very sensitive to, to methane. Uh, also, uh, the Indian mission, the Mars Orbiter mission, carried an instrument that was also supposed to find and localize methane. Uh, and that instrument hasn't worked. Uh, just hasn't done what worked in the way, even when they pointed at a known source, uh, they don't see anything. So that, that's not working. But this, uh, the TGO uh, is probably our best bet to try to understand how these things are happening. Because if it happened once, it happened again. And it might not have happened while we've seen it, or we might not be looking in the right place. You know, we never would have known about this one if Curiosity hadn't been basically right on top of it the day that it happened. Nobody would have gone back and looked through old data to find this one faint methane signal. And so it could be that this is happening all the time somewhere on Mars. And it's just that we don't have that many eyes on Mars. And so we're missing it again and again and again. And then we see it once, but really this is happening every month or every year. And an instrument like what's on uh, the trace gas orbiter will hopefully help us pin that down, which will go a long ways toward answering, towards answering where this, what the genesis of the methane might be. Um, do you know if they've ruled out seasonal changes or is it just completely random at the moment? I think this is basically all they have. So there's there was a some talk of whether there was a seasonal methane cycle, and there's there's circumstantial evidence, maybe for that, but there's not like good evidence for it. And it could be that with the trace gas orbiter, which has only been there basically in the last year, that evidence is building up now, and they're just not ready to to make that claim yet. Um, mm. If it was there, that would tell us some neat stuff uh, because there are ways to make methane without life, but they pretty much all involve water. And so that, that would tell us something about the interaction between water and rocks underneath the Martian surface, uh, which is obviously a topic that we're quite interested in. Yeah. 
All right, so I'm gonna show you a really cool picture here, which is what I like to do. Uh, so this is an image, and I'll share this with my co-hosts as well so they can see it. Uh, so uh, NASA's Curiosity rover um, captured two solar eclipses on the surface from the surface of Mars. Uh, one was on uh, March 25th, 2019, uh, and this is Phobos passing in front of the sun. So Phobos passing in between Curiosity and the sun. Good job, Phobos. <laughs> How does it make this image? It looks like it's through like an H-alpha filter or some sort of solar telescope. Yeah, I'm not sure how they were able to actually get this kind of resolution staring at the sun yeah, using Curiosity apparently, instruments. Apparently Curiosity does have a filter for the sun. It's got a filter for this kind of measurement. They've thought of everything. Yeah, yeah. there you go. So that's oh, that Phobos, and then this is Deimos, which is, which is the smaller Good job. one. Look and this was taken on thing. the 17th of March. Look at that tiny little thing. And so you Good can job. see oh. how... So is this just cool, or can we learn something from it? No, it's just cool. <laughs> Let's just enjoy it. That's yeah, just, don't, don't, no, I mean, obviously you can use this to study the size, shape... Uh, of Phobos and Deimos as they're passing in front of the sun, just like still regular solar eclipses here on Earth are are a boon for, for scientists, and they try to observe them as well as the transits. So uh, I'm sure they, uh, they use this for all kinds of scientific purposes. But it's amazing to me how um, the difference in sort of the speed, because Phobos is orbiting more quickly than a length of day on Mars. You can tell it's not round. Ten. It looks yeah. distinctly yeah. not round. Yeah. It's so lumpy. Yeah, it's they're potato. both, I mean, they're both so, yeah, potatoes. And so, you know, Phobos is, of course, uh, orbiting faster than the length of a day on Mars. And so it is, it is uh, spiraling inward, uh, speeding up Mars's uh, rotation speed, and eventually it's going to crash into Mars. It's going to get torn apart, and then it's going to crash into Mars. While Deimos is farther than than Mars turns once a day, and so it's slowly drifting away, uh, like our moon is. But just just a just an amazing trick from from Curiosity. I really love it. It's also a reminder that if we ever go and colonize Mars, those Martian colonists are never going to get a total solar eclipse again. Never again. <laughs> Nope. Um, it's okay. I've never seen one anyway. You you I didn't did. you didn't see the one this year or sorry in 2017? No, don't bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> Despite my best attempts to do it, I got lazy and didn't go. Yeah, no, I was there. I went to I went through all of the effort and I still didn't get a chance to fully see it. So I yeah. saw it. Yeah. And Paul, who was like an hour away from me, got clouds. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. But we'll be there for 2024. 2020. Texas. We're gonna we're gonna stay yeah, with you, Texas. Morgan. Yeah, Please, Texas. That'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think um, someone had one more story. Morgan, you're gonna talk about some artificial. Yes, I had more pretty pictures. I don't. If you follow that link, you will see very beautiful things. Uh, the aurora are something we can see in the northern and southern skies. Uh, if you're high enough in latitude, and that's uh, charged particles from the sun's a solar wind striking our magnetic field and then traveling along those magnetic field lines until they end their lives smacking into the Earth's atmosphere where they knock off uh, electrons from hydrogen and oxygen atoms and they make beautiful colors. Uh, but the structure of our magnetic field is uh, a real puzzle. And mag magnetophysics are, is one of the weirdest, hardest things in in physics. And part of that is because we can never really see anything. The aurora, you can see there's this fluffy uh, green haze that we're seeing in the background. Uh, and so this experiment sent up two sounding rockets, which are little rockets that can just sort of go up into space, but they're not going into orbit. And they threw out just tons of uh, chemicals into the atmosphere that would react with these particles that um, would well, react with these particles from the solar wind and create these very distinctive uh, patterns depending on what was hitting them. And they were able to use these basically to track the path of, um, of solar wind particles as they entered the atmosphere and then struck something and then caused this chain reaction. And that's going to teach us something about the magnetic 
field of the earth, but really they're just really pretty. Yeah, just amazing. Uh, this this kind of feels drawing. like, you know, 10 years from now, this is going to be the new rich person's fireworks. <laughs> uh, you know, you're going to rent your your uh, Falcon 9 and you're going to throw up a bunch of this stuff for your wedding and you're going to have these beautiful uh, color splotches uh, in the night sky. <laughs> no. They're just, they're just, go look at the pictures, the videos. They're just, they're really pretty. Please and don't. they're science. Only for be, science. There has to be some UFO one. reports. Yeah. Oh, I bet. Um, if anyone so, wants to get me one for my birthday, <laughs> you, I mean, so you're okay. I won't you're, say no. You're okay with like the the one time and having all the astronomers yell yes. at you just one time. Yeah. Uh, no problem. All right. So There's a couple cool of announcements. Uh, we were supposed to be announcing the results of the Falcon Heavy carrying the uh, Arabsat uh launch today but it got scrubbed so it's gonna happen tomorrow so i'm sorry you're gonna have to wait a week to find out what happened i mean we'll know tomorrow but you know we won't you know what else it. is happening tomorrow fraser i i do but tell me uh the Bereshit lander is gonna land on the moon it is the first privately developed craft to land on the moon it's gonna do it i'm not jinxing anything what are you talking about <laughs> Um, it's a really exciting mission. It's going to land. It's going to be live broadcast. Uh, is it, yeah, is it taking descent video as it, it goes down? It should be, yes. Um, uh, I thought that was the most amazing thing when we saw uh, Changa 4 land, is because the way the moon craters just get more and more craters the farther down you go, it looked like you were miles above the surface, and then suddenly it landed. And it's just all these like dime-sized craters in... And I just want more of that. It was yeah. just so mesmerizing. It's like a fractal. Well, yeah. and and I mean, space. We've we've had a ch chance to interview uh, Yoav uh, Lansman, and back. so uh, I, we haven't seen him recently. But I think it's just because he's busy, he's very um, busy. and I'm sure Flying we'll spaceships. be able to uh, talk to him after the actual landing and get uh, maybe a follow up interview to find out how everything is going. So. Uh, yeah. From all of us here at the Weekly Space Hangout, we are totally rooting for you guys to to Good land uh, yeah. on, the, on the surface of the moon. Yeah, so go I check see. out the live broadcast tomorrow. I think it starts at like 2.30 Eastern. It should be on their YouTube page, their homepage, their Facebook, their Twitter, Yeah, anywhere videos are found. All right, I got one last picture that I want to show everybody. Um, I want to give a big congrats to my friend Corey Schmitz from oh. Photographing Space uh, for capturing this shot of Saturn getting occulted behind the moon. Is that a single, a single astronomy picture frame? of the day That's... yesterday. Uh, Corey, Corey even told me, he's like, do you want to live stream this with me? I'm like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Um, but then I, we just never got around and now, to it. And now who's laughing? And now yeah. Corey's laughing. So we did a big story on Universe Today. But but great job, Corey. This is just a stunning photograph and totally worthy of Astronomy Picture of the Day. Nice work. Love that. Awesome. All right, uh, Ian, you're our special guest. Um, what are you working on? that uh, people should go and, and check out? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing now. <laughs> well, your brain is completely emptied after all of the work leading up yeah, to no, today. I'm, um, apparently, I'm an editor for um, Mercury Magazine with the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, so I'm currently working on that. Um, a very good uh, non-profit organization for uh, astronomy and education, so check them out. They're based up in San Francisco. Love that group. Um, so I'm still their editor. Um, I'm uh, still doing my freelance writing, and you can catch some of my writing on astroengine.com, and you can always find me on Twitter. I spend way too much time on this thing. So. Um, and my handle is astroengine. Astroengine Astro on Engine. all the things. Astroengine. Yes, one word. It's a good name. Where did you... Where did that come from? My dad. Do you remember the dot com boom when everybody was buying up domain names? Yeah, that's it's, how I got Universe yeah, Today. Late late nineties was it or something? And that just happened to be one of the ones he grabbed because he knew I like space, and he just held on to it for ages. He was going to sell it. He had like an offer for like five hundred pounds. He was going to sell it. He was like, I was like, no, I can get more for it. So hold on to it, and it ended up being my domain name and my handle. So yeah, thanks, dad. Twitter handle and all of that. So, yeah. Morgan, what are you working on? Yeah, well, if you're missing Paul Matt Sutter, uh, I have good news for you. On Monday, 
he will be giving a lecture uh, in Fort Worth uh, at, I think, six o'clock, six, 6.30 uh, at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. Uh, I'll be hosting him for our lecture series. And I think there are, there's, there are tickets, free tickets still available if you just want to come and watch. And I think there are still a few tickets for the VIP reception. So for a crack in $10, you can have a cocktail and chat with Paul and uh, we'll, make, we'll make an evening of it. So uh, yeah, check that out at our website, uh, fwmuseum.org. That's awesome. You need to take a picture of that yeah. as I will proof. Do, I will do my best to get a selfie with Paul. Kimberly. Also, I spent all of today not only geeking out about black holes with my geoscientist coworkers. Really wrecked your productivity today, <laughs> yeah. didn't it? it? It sort of really did. Uh, but I also <laughs> uh, was writing about the Barashit lander and also a totally different totally different topic uh the environmental effects of building islands in the south china sea good or bad bad yeah how could it be good <laughs> long story short it's not a good thing yeah don't dredge up corals to make your islands it's bad for corals um but you can read all about it uh this week on eos.org uh, and of course, uh, I released yesterday a new episode all about the search for uh, Earth 2.0, all the planet hunting instruments that are coming uh, down the line over the next decade. Uh, and that's on my YouTube channel. And then I was mad at hard work today writing about the black hole. Uh, Chad apparently says it's done, edited. So we're going to be launching our episode about that within the next couple of hours. So stay tuned to my YouTube channel and... Uh, you should get my take on the whole black hole discovery, which is why Thanks, Chad. I knew Thanks, a lot Chad. about it. And Chad is going to be my special guest on the show on my open space on Monday. So uh, if you want to actually meet Chad, uh, come and join us on, on Monday on my Make channel. Make sure you ask him about all the horror stories. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I'm going to put us all there. There's everybody. Uh, so on behalf of all of my co-hosts, thanks to all of the moderators, everybody watching, thanks to all of the astronomers that figured out all the cool stuff about black holes. We really appreciate it. Um, we will see all of you next week.